Hey dudes, dudettes, dudes with dudette parts, dudettes with dude parts, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. This is the first episode of the WoeCast. We have some gear here at the space. It's our little studio in the music garage in Chicago. Hopefully this podcast will sound nice. I bought a, a new mic and we had another new mic we bought recently that I'll be using. Um I'd like to have musicians play some songs on here sometime too. Um, we didn't do that today. You know, mostly that was my fault. Plus, I, I don't want to put somebody through me engineering their audio. I'm not an audio engineer. Maybe sometime my good friend Adam that I, I play in the Miserables with, he is the audio engineer. Hopefully, he can come by sometime. We'll get somebody in here. We'll do some audio, something unique and off the cuff, and 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 hopefully it'll be great. Um, but I'm not going to put anybody through them having the good heart to come out here and do that and me being the engineer. That's not good for anybody. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I, I'm Joe Mizzy. Um, people mostly call me Mizzy, except in Chicago, more people call me by my first name, Joe. But that's like the Smith of first names. And so people ultimately usually end up calling me by my last name in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, I've toured a bit. You know, off off and on. Um, I, I, I've recorded music. I, like I said, I've been around. Um, I, I've been, I've done just enough to be dangerous with music and to have my parents <laughs> be concerned. Um, I think that you know, I, I'll learn as much about these guys doing this as the listeners will, um, which will be great. And 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 that's what I'm I'm really hoping to do here. Uh, fortunately enough, for this first episode, we have Dan Vapid in, in, and what a great guy! I mean, he's done so much. Uh, his history is vast. Um, he has over you know 300 recorded songs. He said 300. It's crazy. 300 songs. It's fascinating to me that a guy has written that many songs. Um, and you know, Dan's a guy that I run into every once in a while around town. It was so awesome of him to, to be the guy who was like, I told him like, I'm starting this thing. I, I'd love to have you on. If you would come on, that would be awesome. And he, he immediately just came back and said, yes, I'll do it. Um, I, I can't thank him enough for doing that. Um, I have some some tangential, you know, seven degrees connections to Dan um, through various projects I've I've been in. You know, he obviously was in Screeching Weasel. I played in a band called Common Rider with with Mass and Lumley and Phil, who all at some point played with Screeching as well. Um, I, I never actually met Dan until a few years ago, though. Um, and, and nowadays, we like I said, we run into each other um, around Chicago. Um, he, you know, Methadone's, Sludgeworth, Riverdale's, Weasel. This guy's done just just so much. Uh, I never saw Weasel with Dan in the band. I did, however, see them during uh, a, a period that Philip Hill was playing with them, who I played with in Common Rider. Uh, this is a little bit before I played with Phil. Uh, at the last minute, me and my good buddy Roman, we got last minute tickets to uh, the 30 minutes of Screechy Weasel show at House of Blues in Chicago, and it was 2001. Uh, I think this might have been the last one of those they did. Um, we got them the night before. I was living in Detroit, and some friends of mine were already planning on going. I had someone from the east side of Detroit call me. They said, I, we, we got these extra tickets. Do you want them? I said, yes, we'll, we'll come out there and get them. This was late at night already. Uh, we drove out to the east side. We came back to my parents. We talked to everyone. We're like, all right, we're all going. We, had, we ended up having like six or seven of us going on this. And then we were like, well, you know, we were all 21 at the time. We're like, dude, we should hang out in Chicago for the night. So me and Rowan, we go on price line. We're all kind of broke at the time. So we're like, we're only going to do it if we can spend like this much money. And it was like somewhere between the six and seven of us, we could spend maybe 150 to 200 bucks on a hotel room for the night. So we're like, let's see what we can get. And at the time, Priceline was the new thing. So we go on to Priceline.com. This is before Shatner and the whole thing. It's like nothing at this point. And we go on, and me and me and Roman, we're like, all right, we, we started at like 60 bucks a night, then 70 bucks a night. We put in $75 a night, and it spits back, and it's like, you got a room, and you're staying at the Doubletree in Sweet Streeterville. I, I didn't know what the Doubletree was at that point. I, I was too young and naive to understand. 
But we're like, awesome. All right. So we're going to Chicago and we're staying in hotel rooms. We, we leave that morning really early because the show is at like noon, if I remember correctly. And we get to Chicago, go straight to the House of Blues. Don't stop at the hotel first. Show's interesting. Ben didn't play most of the stuff I wanted to hear. <laughs> um, and, and it was like 30 minutes and done. That's it. Um, little antagonistic, whatever. Uh, we get done with the show, though. Now, now people could still smoke in Chicago inside at the time. So we walk out of the show, and we are sweaty, just drenched in sweat, and, and we got cigarette ash all over us. At the time, Kevin, my buddy Kevin from who play, was playing with the Tina at the time, he comes, he finds out from Phil after show. Oh, there's a secret show at the fireside tonight. We should go to it. So we're like, all right, we're gonna go, but we gotta go to the hotel first. We gotta, we gotta check in, make sure we get our rooms. So <laughs> we go to the Double Tree. We we get there. We drive over there. Now, as we're driving there, we're starting to realize, uh, okay, this hotel is in, like, the nice part of town. So we park a car, and, and like an asshole, <laughs> I walk into the Doubletree Suites, smelling like I belong at a trucker motel at this point, okay? I reek of booze and cigarette smoke and B.O. I walk in. There's dudes in suits reading the Wall Street Journal on fancy chairs in the lobby. Uh, it, it was like the opposite of being the the clean-cut guy that goes into the trucker bar. This was like the dude who belonged in the trucker bar walking into the exact opposite. It was record scratch. And, it, and these dudes, they're all looking at me. And, and, of course, I was the only one that goes in. I walk up to the counter, and I'll never forget the poor girl at the counter. And she, she's got to wonder what I am doing there at this point. And I walk in, and I walk up to the counter, and I'll, I'll never forget the look and the tone of voice she used. And, and she just looks at me, and she says, can I help you? That tone. <laughs> I'm just It just made me feel so out of place. And uh, I look at her, uh, just kind of bowing my head. I'm like, yes, I, I do have a reservation at this hotel. And she gives me a look that just was like, you could tell she's thinking, no, no, there's no way. And, and I, I take the thing out and I hand her the price line sheet, you know, and, and she's probably thinking, oh, man. So this is what Priceline is going to bring into our hotel. That's all I can think. Just so uncomfortably awkward. It, it was awesome, but just so uncomfortable at the same time because half of me is thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm the, you know, punk rock dude who's here, <laughs> here to like stay at your nice hotel. But then I'm like, dude, I, I don't need to stay at this hotel. What? Uh, uh. So anyway, we, we, we get our rooms and it turns out they are suites. They, they have, kitchenettes sinks two separate rooms it, it, it was nuts i'd never been in a hotel like this in my life at this point um but anyway we had shit to do we we got on our way we i'm pretty sure we got in a cab we didn't really know the public transit system in chicago and, and, we, and we made our way to fireside so we're at fireside and we go to hang out in the bar area I think the show might have been going – it was just chaos in there. There were tons of people there, and, and the whole night was kind of crazy. In between, we had been – we had, I think, gone drinking a little bit. Um, at some point, I think I, my buddies always make fun of me because I kept saying I needed to eat KFC. I, I remember we ate at some little Mexican joint, and I tried the really hot peppers with the carrots and the – the other vegetables in them, and it was it was ridiculous. And, and we get to the we get to the fireside bowl. At some point, um, Roger from Less of Jake and is is there, and he was there because they were leaving on tour with the Teen Idols. Kevin, like I said, was was playing with the Teen Idols at the time. And I think part of the reason that he was there was because he was going to then leave with them to go on tour. Um, I'm kind of geeking out because here's Roger from Less of Jake, one of my favorite bands at the time. And uh, I'm actually sitting next to him at the bar and I'm at a stool. He's at a stool and, and I'm kind of sitting like 
one row away from the bar. And then across from us is, is my buddy and, and his, his stripper girlfriend. And they're sitting like across from us. There's like four of us sitting in a square up against the bar. The, the thing that happens is the stripper girlfriend, and I'm not trying to knock on, on strippers, but you know, she was, she was dressed, uh, let's just say very provocatively. And, um, you know, she at one point undoes, uh, undoes is not, not a great word, but she opens her legs to recross them the other way and does a full on Sharon Stone. <laughs> um, it, it, it was just all out there, like a friggin' slab of deli meat at the deli counter. Okay. I was 21. All right. You know, you're 21. You see this and you're just like, <laughs> What? <laughs> and, and I'll never forget Roger, who, who I didn't really, I think, ever speak directly to the entire night. The the one moment we shared is that we both clearly see this happen. And then we proceed to turn towards each other. And we both just have this nod that we do that's just like, yep, that just happened. <laughs> So there it is. That's that's my weasel story that really has nothing to do with Dan or or Screechy Weasel for that matter. Just just way more about a, a stupidly fancy hotel and a stripper. But let's get into this. Before we do, um, July fifth in Lombard, the Miserables. That's my band that I'm in now. We'll be playing at Brower House in Lombard. We're playing with. Ian from Voice of Addiction, he's a great dude. I think he said he's going to come in here sometime. Hopefully, we'll have that out soon. Um, he does lots of great stuff around town, runs a promotional company, sort of. I don't know if he calls it a company or what. We'll find that out if I talk to him. Um, also, we have a, a big Woe well record show. We do these. We're trying to do them once a year. We're doing it earlier this year, not over the holidays. This is what we're calling Woe Apocalypse. It's going to happen in Warren, Michigan at the Token Lounge on July 13th. Uh, it's also going to be the video release party for uh, the Miserables Bottoms Up video that we did at the Topher House in Warren, Michigan uh, with the lovely Natasha Bess and her stud Kevin. Um, we are playing with PT's Revenge, Wrist Rocket, Cruise Italy, Do North, and Bottle Kids. It's going to be a great show. Uh, we're back in Chicago on July 25th. Uh, we're playing at my favorite bar, Liars Club. Uh, I hope Julia's working. I got to find out. Uh, we're playing with a band called Vortis. Uh, there may be another band on the show. I'll keep everyone posted. Uh, we are hoping that this will end up being our album release party. We are mastering the record on Thursday of this week, if everything goes to plan, at Gravity here in Chicago. Uh, you can keep in touch with me on the Miserables page on Facebook. Uh, the WoCast has a, a page up there. Also, I'm on Twitter at the Mizzy. That's T-H-E-M-I-Z-Z-I. -I, to stay up to date. Uh, in the future, I'll try and maybe tweet. You know, when I have someone in the studio, and if you're watching at the time, maybe you can throw some questions out there. Maybe I can get them in there. We'll see how this works. This is going to be this is a work in progress. Not sure how it's all going to go so far. But anyway. Dan Vapid, folks, here we go. So, um, you know, probably one of the things I want to hear about the most is, you know, where you got started. Like, I know some of the old bands, you know, Sludgeworth. I remember there's a band called Generation Waste, something along those lines. So what, you know, where'd you grow up? What did you, what got you into this whole thing? Um, well, I grew up in Des Plaines. Um, and where is Des Plaines? I don't know the Des suburbs Plains. around here. Okay, uh, Des Plaines is, uh, it's right over by the airport, right over by okay. the airport. Okay. So if you know yeah. where the... Uh, the Allstate Arena is and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not too far from that. Okay, cool. So I uh, grew up right over there and just uh, 
I guess like what started it was probably when I was about five. I just really liked Kiss. I discovered Kiss that young. Eh? At, you remember five, that? Wow. Yeah, I remember I was in my <laughs> front yard, and uh, a kid across the street was talking about Kiss, and uh, so I went over to his house and he put on Kiss and he put on David Bowie. And I remember really liking Kiss a lot. And I remember liking David Bowie a lot. And, you know, I was telling my brother and my mom. And I think my brother kind of knew who Kiss was too. Uh, and then the next day, the kid down the street's like, hey, well, have you ever heard the Beatles? And I said, well, are they anything like Kiss? And he goes, well, yeah, kind <laughs> of. And so I heard, uh, I want to hold your hand. I thought it was really lame. I'm yeah. like, wow, I don't really like that at all. Um now, that's interesting. That is interesting. I find that very interesting. Yeah. So, so I was all about Kiss, and then from Kiss and David Bowie, and then uh, after that, you know, maybe by the time I was about seven, ACDC, uh, you know, Black Sabbath, Ozzy, all that stuff, um, and then from there, of course. So when is this? This is like. Oh, I mean, we're talking this... about. Uh, I was five in nineteen seventy-five. So. Okay. Um. You know, by about 1977, 78, I was more into like, you know, I was still into Kiss a lot, but, you know, in other bands as well. Um, so, like, rock just kind of progressed its way into heavy metal, which at one point, maybe when I was about eight or nine, just started listening to Judas Priest and the Scorpions and discovering that. Definitely by the time I was 10, I was into heavy metal. Um, heavy metal led to Metallica, you know, and Metallica had misfits t-shirts on and discharge and uh you know wow who's that you know if these guys are metallica like like these bands i mean i i want to i want to hear them yeah. so i heard the misfits and i was like whoa okay and discharge and some of these bands so um from there we just like me and my friends are like wow um you know i guess we like punk music now <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know because we it. all had like long hair and we were all like you, you hear that early metallica stuff and mm -hmm. you see the early metallica stuff and they were definitely you know inspired by that that certain like kind of more more dirty grainy punk rock like the misfits that was out there at the time so that's right. that's kind of interesting that that metallica right. the heavy metal band is your gateway to punk rock it, it was my gateway cool. to punk rock yeah. was metallica actually yeah. yeah because they had you know they were into punk and hardcore and yeah. i noticed that the that slayer were too so um you know you know from there i was so we just started listening to hardcore and i i you know um had discovered wnur uh fast and loud which is a show on saturday nights up in evanston Okay. Back in the eighties. Is that this still was on? probably about know. um no, not fast and loud isn't on, but I, they might have some punk show now, but I don't know of one. Okay. Um but this was around nineteen eighty four and uh you know, I had heard like all these bands one night. Like just the big boys, the offenders. I remember hearing the Dead Kennedys, I remember hearing Articles of Faith, it was completely blown away. So every Saturday night we would tune in to WNUR. Um, and, you know, so, and, and listen to hardcore, you know, so this is at a, a point where, you know, I had never even thought of picking up an instrument at all. Um, you know, my, uh, my grandmother was a pianist. She was a professional pianist and my, my brother played guitar and my, my cousin gave like lessons. He was like a virtuoso kind of guitar player. Okay. And, uh, and I really didn't really even want to play music because I thought if my older brother played guitar, there's no way I wanted to play guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I already tried playing the drums when I was a kid and it, and it didn't work out. I just couldn't, I couldn't get back on the beat in time, uh -huh. you know? So I would oh, do dude, a I'm fill. A terrible drummer. Right. I would do a fill so and then bad. I would just, <laughs> and that would, that would be that. So there was a, uh, some kids that I knew and they had a band and they were called Angel Slayer. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they, they, you know, like the, the guy that was going to sing for them, I guess he just didn't come over to the house that day. It was a bunch of friends of mine. And uh, they had some lyrics, and I just started singing the lyrics just just for the hell of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and they said, wow, I really like your voice. I said, you do? And they're like, yeah. That goes kind of like James Hetfield-ish. I'm like, <laughs> I was really surprised, you know, so – 
like my friends gave me a lot of encouragement to sing. So, you know, we probably tried that like maybe one afternoon. Well, from there, we just decided that we were going to be this hardcore band instead. <laughs> no yeah. more metal. We're going to do this <laughs> hardcore band. And a friend of mine gave me a bass, and I think it had like two strings on it. <laughs> and my the drummer had buckets, you know, five-gallon buckets. Yeah. And a guitar player uh, who I was also in a band with in Sludgeworth, Adam, he was the only yeah. one that actually had an amp. <laughs> so we played in his garage. I think we hooked up a mis- like a – I know Mr. Microphone and a boom, like a broomstick, taped it, and we made some noise out of the garage. And we had songs like Stage Dive, and um, we had a song called THC Makes Me High. This This is is like about 1984, 85. So you got to figure even just access to music gear wasn't even. We we would hear some right. We would hear all these hardcore songs. We're like, wow, this is really outrageous. So we were gonna try to do something outrageous in the garage. You know, not really knowing what the hell we're doing. Yeah. You know, so we did that for a little bit. And uh, I, you know, one time we had like a party with, you know, another, you know, some other friends in a neighboring suburbs. And uh, they were in a band and they actually had real instruments. <laughs> you know, the bass yeah. player had a bass amp and the guitar player had a guitar amp. And drummer had a real drum set. And, uh, in and I saw them. I was like, wow, these guys are really cool. And they were called DSB, decrepitly sedated bakeheads. <laughs> okay. So, um, again, more there Joe Cardcore. Like punk rock band. Right, right. Too. More Joe Cardcore was going on. And, yeah. you know, um, but I ended up playing bass for them and singing for them. And we did like two shows. Um, so you played bass before shows. guitar then? I, I played bass just because someone threw a bass at me. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, I guess I'll. You know, I'll learn this thing yeah. and play it. Um, and I was singing pretty much right off the bat. Um, so uh, I played like two shows with this band. Um, and, you know, it didn't really obviously go anywhere. But um, there was another band that was auditioning singers. And he said, you know, hey, we'd like you to try out for us. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah, sure. And they were called Generation Waste. And so that was the band that really was kind of what really did it. Yeah. Um, and how was old like were a hard... you when you started with that? Uh, I think I was 16. Okay. So this is like late 80s, mid 80s? Yeah. Like it was uh, in – I joined the band in uh, very late 86, but my first show was in uh, January of 87. Okay. Okay. And then how long did that last for? That lasted um, – I think about a year and a half, but in that period, um, you know, we had like a demo tape. And yeah, bands had demos back then. Nobody really had. Uh, some bands had had seven inches and stuff like that, yeah. but it was pretty popular to have a demo. Yeah, and sell it at on the a merch. cassette tape. Yeah, too, at a, right? on, a, yeah. on a cassette tape. Yeah, I was still there for the cassette tape. Yeah, era, so. yeah. yeah. Um. So, um, but yeah, that was the band that was like the first real band that I had played in. And, uh, you know, we had played, we opened up for the exploited. We opened up for corrosion of conformity. We opened up for Reagan youth, uh, life sentence, the adolescence. We played with all kinds of bands back in the day when they still had opening bands. (laughs) Right. For shows like right, that. right. Yeah. Um, we were actually we we're playing at this place in uh, Palatine a lot called Dirty Nellies. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, now they have moved down the street and are a bigger venue, but at yeah. the time they were like a, maybe a block down the street and they were a smaller venue. Okay, so we played there. Um, you know, pretty much all over where you pretty much could play. Um, you know, in. Uh, Lincoln Square, right by my wife's chiropractic clinic, there's a bank that used to have shows there. So I'm I'm always walking by and remembering, oh, that's where I broke my arm stage diving. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <clears throat> yeah. That was not at your own show or was it? Oh, uh, no, that was uh, <laughs> that was not my own show. No. That would be great. That was for life sentence. And okay. I broke my arm. As you can see right here, uh, the bone never healed. Oh, dude. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And you play guitar yeah. with that hand. Wow, uh, I, I, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How does that affect so, it? Oh, it, it doesn't. I don't know. Now you're still, your hand yeah, still functions fine. fine. Yeah. So I started off playing hardcore, 
But I realized um, while I was in Generation Waste, like I was discovering more of the early punk stuff. I was discovering like the Ramones and the Dickies and um, uh, the Buzzcocks. And I was like, wow. And sometimes at at band practice, we would kind of play the Ram- a Ramone song um, a little bit or a Misfit song at Generation Waste practice. And I was like, you know, I really wish I was kind of playing more stuff like this and not hardcore. Mm-hmm. I liked hardcore and I still do. Um, but it was just more of what I wanted to do. And by the time I heard the Ramones and I had heard Naked Ray Gun, I was like, okay, that's it. Those were the two bands that <clears throat> made me want to take music a little more seriously. So from there, it evolved into pretty much what it is today. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those influences are still pretty ingrained in me when I write a song. There's, yeah. something, there's something that the Ramones kind of did, and there's something that Naked Ray Gun kind of did. <laughs> um, and even when I'm trying to not. And I mean, I'm sorry. Let me let me rephrase that. I'm not trying to write a song like the Ramones or Naked Ray Gun yeah. at all. But there's still always a little element in there. Well, you get the threat like of it for sure. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah, it's so that that's kind of that's yeah. kind of the story of where. So that's where, how you got led. to singing, songwriting, right? You know, and where right. in there did you start playing guitar? Um. Well. Well, that's an interesting question too. I just like I like I said I had a bass, and then someone gave me an acoustic guitar and showed me how to write a you know play a bar chord. So I did you know. So first it was just kind of moving it along the neck and not not actually playing real chords. But eventually I you know people would teach me little things and I was playing chords. And I can remember the, the first song that I wrote. I I had heard. A social distortion song and I would it was really common for me back then too to always write lyrics in a journal even before I had ever written a song I was always writing in a journal like a like a teenager does yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I was doing it in song form yeah and without even realizing that's what I was doing I was like okay here's verse here's chorus here's verse um, before I had ever written a song at all so I had had some words and I was like, you know, here's this social distortion song. It's three chords. What if I just were to reverse these chords and sang my words? Mm-hmm. And I did. And I, what I found is that I had my own song, and it didn't sound like social distortion at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it actually sounded like <laughs> one of my songs. Yeah. Um, so from there, I just started kind of just building my own kind of thing and just try to figure out what I did well and what I didn't do well. And, of course, there was – a lot of uh, trial and error along the way, but I, I had just discovered that early on that you know, um, you know, a lot of people that I knew at the time are really trying really hard to be original. And since then, I realized you know it's not really, really, it, it is important, but just being you is what's original, right? I once once heard a, a interview with with Elvis Costello uh, working with Burt Bacharach and he went out of his way to write a song like Burt Bacharach didn't even notice played it for him he's like Man, I just figured it was one of his songs <laughs> he's like I was trying to write a song like you he's like yeah don't hear it man you know yeah. and that's that's the kind of thing I'm talking about yeah. no matter what it's going to sound like him yep even if he's trying to sound like somebody else yeah. you know well so, once he starts uh, singing I yeah. mean yeah. So at that point, then, so you play it's, in Generation very, Waste for a while, yeah. And then what came after Generation Waste? Um, after Generation Waste, I had tried with some stuff for like about a year, and just nothing kind of got off the ground. I I actually did a band, and we called the Subverts, and we played like a show once, and it was just it just wasn't moving forward, mm-hmm. you know. So um, we just folded real quick. Sometime in 89, I had formed Sludgeworth. There were some other guys in a band. Um, uh, they were like in a hardcore band. They kind of wanted to change direction a little bit. And uh, my friend Adam, who I originally started in the garage with, I had bumped into him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I told him you know, I wanted to start playing. And, and uh, he, was, he was really into it. And, then, you know, I kind of told him what I wanted to play. And he was like, yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly what I want to do, too. Yep. Um, so we had 
played and just, uh, you know, we got Brian McQuaid and started playing um, a Sludgeworth, um, you know, and I did that for a while. Uh, at the same time, I was also playing in Screeching Weasel, playing mm -hmm. bass. And so how did that come about? Did you know Ben from before? Or? I, I, I did. I, yeah. I knew him from Generation Waste. Generation Waste and Screeching Weasel played shows together. Okay. So, uh, you know, that was the same kind of thing. Hey, we're looking for a bass player. You want to you wanna play with us? I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay. And so were you playing bass and Sludgeworth? At the time? No, no. No, you were just, playing guitar. I was just, just singing. singing. Just yeah. singing. Just okay. singing, yeah. Okay. I know this, the, the, the chronology. Yeah, it's, <laughs> well, it's, dude, it's you all have over such place. a history. Yeah, of, I know. It's kind of confusing. Bands you've been involved right. with. and No, I think it's great. I mean, you know, you're you're one of the most prolific dudes that I know out there in terms of punk rock. I mean, you've been in so many bands, written so many songs. You have this catalog. You know, when I'm looking at your, your kind of history of what you've done, there's just so much out there, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's a weird thing. It's kind of... Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I don't think I, I like I said, I didn't really. You were just doing I, it. I just something I fell into. Yeah. But I realize now, since you know, looking back, as you know, I'm 43 now. Yeah. And when I look back, when I was a little kid, I used to make my own album covers yeah. and stuff in school. But you're still doing oh, it. I mean, you had, you had two <laughs> albums, already right? And I was worth writing the material for the new band. Right. I was writing lyrics <laughs> before I even written a song, and I, yeah. I was doing that when I was like kind of like a little kid, even. Yeah. So, um. I guess it's just destiny of some, yeah. some weird thing, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, now it's 2013. I've played on, uh, I believe it's 25 records that I've, mm -hmm. I've played on now. And I've written close to 300 songs. Wow. Written or co-written. So um, it's just gone on pretty consistently since, you know... Um, since I started recording music, yeah. which was in 1990. Yeah, I find that interesting. I mean, I've been writing more lately myself, but, you know, my start wasn't with a lot of songwriting. I was doing a lot of playing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was playing guitar and stuff like that. I wasn't necessarily always the songwriter in the band. And I've had a few that I have been, but now that I'm doing it more often, I find myself challenging myself to, to write with that kind of frequency. Um, it's it's different for someone I think that that didn't grow up doing that, you know. So it's more of a challenge for me, I think, especially when it comes to like getting lyrics done on the page, you know, and having that kind of lyrics just finished to exactly where you want them to be. Sometimes I like I, think I feel like I overthink, part. you know, I overthink them. Oh, I think sometimes. we all do that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's one of the uh, I, that's something every musician I think falls into that trap yeah. of overthinking stuff. That's yeah. a, and it is a trap. You just oh, kind of got to, you really just got to feel, feel it and go with it. It's yeah. kind of Zen like. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, there's no doubt. I'll find songs. You really that just got to give up. Go with that now. mood yeah, yeah. and just kind of, kind of ride out that feeling. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had songs where I've done that now where if, if I can't get it where it needs to be, I mean, I'll keep it on the page because I have had, you know, two or three of them that then some, some time I'll come back to them like, oh, I got the rest of this done, you know? And do you ever have stuff like that where it's like you come um, back to songs or no? Yeah, oh yeah, all the yeah. time. I mean, yeah. I have songs that I, I, I I've written and I don't even really know why I wrote them. Yeah. Like I, you know, I have. Uh, I was just playing a song just early this morning, a, a song that's just been around for about a year now, and I really like the song, but I don't think any of my my fans would like it. Yeah. So I'm just kind of playing it and just kind of going, I don't really know I wrote it, but it's catchy and I, yeah. I just kind of like it. Yeah. It just came out the way it came out. Um, and that's the other thing. It's just, I think, you know, uh, with, with, with songwriting, you just kind of have to go with that. Let it, let it come out. Don't, mm -hmm. don't try to force anything too much. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, so back to, so you're, you're late eighties, early nineties, you're playing at Sludgeworth. And you're playing in Screeching Weasel. Yeah, I was playing in both at the same time. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously Screeching Weasel, Screech numerous, yeah. numerous changes over the years. How long was your first stint with them? Actually, Screeching Weasel was first. Screeching uh, Weasel was Screeching first. Screeching Weasel was first, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we had broken up briefly, like uh -huh. maybe for a year. And then I had, was playing in Sludgeworth. I'd formed Sludgeworth. And then Screeching Weasel got back. And that's when I was playing in both. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
And what albums were during that part? Um, the album that I had started with Screeching Weasel was a, a, a 45 called Punk House. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is when I started playing with the band. Okay. And then, uh, you know, we had done some stuff for some comps and stuff like that. And then we had broken up. Um, when we had gotten back together, that's when we, we uh, did My Brain Hurts. Okay. Yep. And that's when Weasel kind of. Right. Right. Started. Right taken off a little bit right now was what well was, was that album? album that that album was in 1991 like we had okay. we had got back together and um you know i remember ben asking me if i had any song ideas i said yeah and i played him for him and he really liked him and then i also started just kind of he was doing the bulk of the songwriting in that band i only wrote a couple songs on each record but mm -hmm. um what I brought into that band was the backing vocals. So I would, I would hear these things and I'm like, Hey, what do you think of this? He'd be like, yeah, you know, so we would, we would, uh, you know, bounce ideas off each other. And, um, and that was a lot of fun doing yeah. all that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the record was, was my brain hurts. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's and, definitely the first, you know, weasel record I recall hearing, you know, definitely around, you know, for myself, getting into punk rock was definitely that kind of early 90s punk ska wave sure. that came through, right? And I mean, you know, at the time, the big stuff, you know, that everybody was listening to was like Nirvana and, you know, Pearl Jam. And then there was still like some lingering Guns N' Roses out yeah. there and like... You know, people are listening to Radiohead and yeah, and I was all over the place because, like you said, about not wanting to do it. Your brother did. I didn't want to do it. My older sister did, and she was listening to all this stuff, but she wasn't really into like the Nirvanas of the world and stuff like that. And right. That's where I started, kind of getting into it, and then it was like late '93. You know, you first started hearing the Offspring and Green Day, and sure. you know all those early '90s punk bands that kind of broke sure, in the mainstream. Sure. You started started hearing that stuff on the radio, and that's when I found myself at all the old record stores that used to be around in Detroit. Most of them are gone now, but then you know we would just me and my buddies would just go sift through the CDs, right? And we would just like look for stuff like we'd find a band we like and then we'd check the credits and we'd be like what bands do they like and you'd see all the thank yous and you go yeah you know and, and back then they used to just have these discount bins where you know you can get these cds for three four bucks five bucks whatever right and so all of us you know at the time were were young so either we had our allowance or by the time i was 16 you know we had you know jobs i was a caddy and, you know, we'd take our money and we'd go to the record <laughs> store. And a caddy, huh? Oh, dude. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, and, and we would just buy these CDs. I mean, that's definitely where I came across Weasel for the first time and, and, and so many other bands, you know. So so you did, you know, you did My Brain Hurts. How, how much more happened before? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to remember the history correctly. But, but you know, you were in the band – um, Jughead was in the band, and then and at band. some point, Lumley and Mass joined yeah. the band. Right? right, that would have been later. I was in a band. Uh, it would have been – yeah, the band had, was around and broken up a few times, so I got back. So I um, was in the band, late 80s, mm -hmm. broke up for a year, came back, yeah. did My Brain Hurts, did Wiggle. Did Anthem for A New Tomorrow. Then I wasn't in the band. And then they did another record with uh, Mike Durnt played. That's right. In, in, That's on right. a record. Then the band folded again. Yep. And we did the Riverdales for a little while. Then went back to Screeching Weasel. And that was a band. And then who who else was in the that Riverdales? Was, that was Dan Panic as well. Panic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when we were doing the Riverdales, so the Screeching Weasel was over. But then we eventually kind of went back to Screeching Weasel again. Did my – did uh, – Bark like a dog. But there was a period where I didn't play live for a while. I went to culinary school. You know, I was wow. working in in restaurants and stuff like that. And uh, I think it was like some point, like right around 2000, I was like, I, I had all these. I kept writing songs, though, the whole time. They would just kind of come. And I was like, I, I want to I wanna get a band together again. Yeah. And I knew it was going to be one or the other. I could either like move a career in with that and been working nights the rest of my life mm -hmm. <clears throat> or I could try to give music another shot. Yeah. But it couldn't be both. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I just ended up going with the music thing again. Yeah. Um, you know, so I did that at some point in, uh, in 2000 and started mm-hmm. the methadones. So now you have Dan Vapid in the cheats. Correct. You guys have been doing this for about a year and a half, a year and a half now. Okay. And then you're, you're recently a dad, right? Am I am correct yeah. in that. So, you are correct. you know, how do you, um, yeah. And I have a lot of friends who are new dads right now yeah. and all, kinds I am of a new dad. <laughs> yeah. And all kinds of different age ranges, dudes uh-huh. that are in their twenties and dudes that are in their forties that are new dads. Mm-hmm. So, um, you guys are still playing, you're still writing, you know, you yeah. guys have, are doing some road work. Um, you know, what, what's it like juggling all it's, of that? It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've, I find all the time that I, I just feel squeezed for time. I mean, yeah. even today I have an hour to spare. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm, I'm you know, watching I, the clock so. and I gotta go back, but, um, it's something that I'm just going to have to learn, you know, time yeah. management. Yeah. That's what it is. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love playing music enough to, to keep going with it. Yeah. And how old is your kid? He's two. He two. just turned a two a couple, couple weeks okay. ago. All right. Well, that's, it's amazing, man. So now uh, as you look back, I mean, I'm trying to figure out the right way to phrase this, you know, what, what were your favorite moments? What were the not so favorite moments? I guess is what well, I'm trying to get at. Like, yeah, what were the, what were the highs? What were the lows? Right? Well, the lows were dealing with Ben Weasel, you know, uh, but like looking back, I think we did some great records, but yep. you know, I mean, my, my experience of playing in that band is pretty much soured. Um, and is this, you know, and it's not just, to- it's not just the South by Southwest okay. stuff. It's just a bunch of other stuff yeah. too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've never actually met Ben. I know so did, a lot of dudes. Yeah. Who have, I mean, I've just to get that out of the way I, with the Ben, but there, there you go. I yeah. would say that's the, that's the low point for yeah. me. I mean, it had a lot of highs in there too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he really was a great songwriter and I learned yeah. a lot from him, but well, that seems to be the challenge. You can't change thing. somebody's personality. Exactly. And that, you know, I don't want to speak for other people, but I mean, the constant impression I've had is that he's a really challenging dude to kind of yeah, work and with it's, and get along yeah, with. And it's just written. never going to change. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, some great songs. Right, some of right. my favorite punk rock tunes are right. weasel tunes. And that's, right. that's, that's yeah, hard I mean, to separate it from, is. you know, everything you hear and some of the incidents that have happened over the years and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, so take that aside. So that's, that's that would be low. that would be some of the I mean that's some it's kind of mixed because some of it is also high like yeah like you know doing my brain hurts was really important to me as well because it was the first record that I had played on where um, I had ideas I put them out and everybody liked them and yeah I was a contributor for the first time I mean yeah. you know when I was playing in Generation Waste I would have ideas and everybody would be like oh Dan's got an idea isn't that cute because <laughs> <laughs> I was the youngest they're all older yeah, older guys yeah, than yeah. me oh yeah I know that so too. um by the time I had played in Screeching Weasel and I was throwing them out there I was just they were very well received the ideas that I had and that was really important too that mm. gave me a lot of confidence yeah um so that part of it was really good so there's um when I say that being, uh, you know, the other stuff being a low, I, I mean that, but I also think it's also a high point. Yeah. Well, it's very, it's like got to be pretty compl- conflicting then. When right. It is very it conflicting. Because, yeah. You know, if, if, yeah, you played on my brain hurts, which is a classic right. album. Right. Right. So, so there was some good, and we had some really good shows. So there's yeah. some good moments in there, but you know, yeah. most of it was, so you guys aren't talking. Most of it was dealing even. with him was really, really, you yeah. know, impossible. You guys talking or no, 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 I don't. Yeah. I don't talk to him. So, so there's that, but then like another high point for me would probably be, you know, like the first time that my mom had come out and saw Sludgeworth play. She came Mm -hmm. with my brother and like, we went over like super, super well. And like, I just remember just my mom, how she just lit up when she came in the back. Oh, that. That's and an like amazing it, feeling. Right? Uh, yeah, I kind of uh, sorry. It kind of chokes like, me up even just telling the story oh, because, yeah. like, I like I just never felt like uh, you know growing up. I really, you know, I wasn't really that gr- good at sports. Uh-huh. Not that great of a student. Like, I didn't really know where I fit in, and yeah. I find found something, and I did it really well. And my mom was just like like really super impressed. Yeah. 
Yeah, I had those. So I had those struggles, man. Where it's like, I, I mean, I was the nerd in school, is what I was when I was a kid, and so you know, I was definitely like, I was the freaky outcast. Yeah, <laughs> those are the dudes the I got along. I was the, the freak, best, though. <laughs> Seriously, like we were the ones who got along right. with each other. Like I got along with so many stoners, it wasn't even right. funny. Cool right. kids didn't give a shit about me, but the stoners were like, "Yeah, man, you're all right, dude." You yeah, know, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Like it was a weird mix at our school, man. But then. My parents were pretty against, like, <laughs> me getting, you know, I grew up, I played the violin. My dad mm. played the guitar, and so I picked up the guitar here and there over the right. years. Um, I ended up going to school for music, but my parents, by the time I was going to school for music, were already starting to get worried that I was starting to play guitar more. And that's really when I started playing in bands, was after, like, the age of 17, 18 years old is when I started playing in bands. And my parents were, you know, super nervous and I actually had to take time off of college to go play with Common Rider when they asked me to play guitar with them. And my parents, of course, were livid, right, <laughs> right that I was doing this. Just, right. just couldn't believe that I was doing this. But the icing on the cake was we played a show in Vegas and we played at the Joint in the Hard Rock Hotel. Now, my parents love mm -hmm. Vegas, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So I called them like, please take a trip this weekend come on out and see it. And it was the same thing, dude. It's like my parents get VIP access to like the upper balcony in, in the hard rock venue, the joint, I think it was called at the time. And you know, they just couldn't believe it. They were blown away that this is what it was like, you know, and they're coming up to me. They're hanging out with the Donna's, you know, drummer's mom and guitar player's mom and yeah, stuff like that. Sure. They were just blown away. And the funny story about that, I'll just inject that in there is while we're like just hanging out, you know, waiting during the day, my parents came to the casino to come meet me. And, uh, I get a call from my dad and he's like, we're here. We're hanging out in the, there's like the circular kind of casino there in the hard rock. We're hanging out here, you know, come out and find us when you can. So, you know, I get my stuff together 10, 15 minutes later, I go walk out there and, uh, Jim from Jimmy Eat world and his pregnant wife at the time are standing across from my parents and my parents are having a conversation with them. Now my dad is hilarious like this. I walk up to them and I'm like, Hey dad, what's going on? And dad looks at me and goes, Oh, what's going on, Joe? Hey Joe, this is uh this is uh Jim. Jim, right? Jim, yeah. Hey Joe, this is Jim. Jim and I'm just looking at Jim, who we already did a show with the night before, right. just like <laughs> Oh <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were just like shooting the shit about Notre Dame football is what they were doing. Right. You know? So dude, just absolutely insane when your parents get that level of like Wow, this is like you can do something with this, you know, and it's fulfilling. Yeah, I mean, I love that. So yeah, I mean, I I, I get it. Why your mm -hmm. parents or any parent would respond well, the way that they to did deal with it at some point. So um, yeah, I mean, if 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 my son happens to like music, you know, yeah. maybe he won't. I mean, I didn't like the things my parents liked, so it's very possible that uh, you know mm -hmm. that, that he won't take the same path, and you know, you just never know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, it, on a very practical sense, it doesn't. It, it really doesn't make sense to go and quit college <laughs> and play in a band. <laughs> well, I didn't quit. But I went back our, and finished. You, you went back, back and back finished. And finish, but yeah. I can see as a parent oh, yeah. why you would be upset at that. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think there's there's so much to be said of you know we only have one shot. Exactly. And uh, you know. I mean, I'm a very, very strong believer in soaking up all the experiences that you can while you're on this planet. Well, and so, I think that's part of the difference, right? There, uh, yeah. There's people that are very cautious, right? They, and I, right. you know, this isn't really something to do for the the faint of heart, right? Because there there are struggles when you do stuff like this, right? You're gonna you're gonna go broke. <laughs> You're going to, you know, be sleeping in a van, right, in crappy hotel rooms if you're lucky, right, random people's couches, you know. Um, so, yeah, but then you have those highs that go along with it where you get to do these things, like you play that show, right, and it's just amazing. Sure. And those sure. can be small shows. Those can be big shows. I mean, some of my yeah. favorite shows are small ones. But Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally know what you mean. I mean, yeah. I would say, like, 
with that, that was, you know, I was opening for Naked Ray Gun when my mom came out. Now, mm-hmm. Naked Ray Gun are one of the reasons I wanted to be in a band. Yeah. First time I'm ever playing with them. So now, not only am I playing a show with Naked Ray Gun, which was a big deal at that time mm-hmm. in, you know, in 1990, but my mom came and was really impressed. So I yeah. got like both things. Um, you know, I did a, a tour with Green Day that was pretty special because like, yeah. um, you know, especially in Detroit. Which band was that with? Was with that, the Riverdales. With the Riverdales. Riverdales had opened up for Green Day in, uh, in the United States and Canada and, and Europe as well. Um, and, you know, when I walked out in, in Detroit, mm-hmm. you know, your hometown, yeah. when I walked out. Where did you guys play? We played Cobo Hall. Wow. <laughs> so I remember when I walked out on the Holy stage, God. I was thinking. What year was this? This was in 1995. Five. So right when yeah. they were just like. Dookie was the biggest album. In yeah, that they had Insomniac at that point. Yeah, it had just it had just come out, so they were playing stadiums and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, but um, you know, I, I remember walking on stage and thinking, "This is where Kiss Alive, uh, the Kiss Alive record was recorded." Yeah, and I was I was standing on stage and I'm looking out and I'm like, "That's probably where those two guys were holding that sign." Yeah, and I was thinking back of you know how I told you when I was when I was a little kid, I was super into kiss and I yeah. would just l- listen to that record like for hours and just stare at the back cover. And here I was yeah. playing, playing Cobo hall and like, like looking and going like, like, wow, this is where the kiss record yeah. was. And I got really, really nervous going up yeah. that night. Oh know? yeah. I mean, uh, for that reason, <laughs> I can't even, it was one I've of those never things. done anything near that big. That is right. just, that's absolutely intense. I mean, right. I don't, I, I don't get like nerves anymore but i and i never really did i was always okay with that but i do remember when we played the first like big big show with common rider like we did a lot of like you know 500 to a thousand person venues which were big but then we played uh we played the electric factory in in uh what's that it's in philadelphia right it's like five thousand or six thousand seaters sold out yeah i just remember that that moment i remember is where it all kind of hit me i mean for me it was a lot i think um more uh immediate than you because i just kind of sort of fell into the common rider thing you know which was a very quick, like went from local little band to, oh my God, I'm going on tour for three months and I'm playing all these huge venues. Right. And I'm playing with this dude, Jesse, and then Mass yeah. and Lumley sure. and Phil, who are all in bands that I listened to. like Notable growing. bands, sure. Y- yeah, right. And it was just this huge thing. But that night, like the nerves, I remember were just like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. This is weird. Like people yeah. are actually watching this. Like, captively there's thousands of people paying attention to what you're doing well yeah that's funny a story about nerves is i could tell you one when i played that green day tour the very first show that we did was a, a festival and it was during the day so yeah. as we all know as musicians you know when you're on stage you don't really see much in the yeah. audience well our first show was during the day so i saw everybody and there was yeah. ten thousand people under oh, a wow. tent and it was the Riverdales, it was Radiohead, it was Beck, it was Foo Fighters, oh, and Green Day. <laughs> and we're first, and I'm the first one to sing. <laughs> you're the you're the opening act. I'm we're the, op- the we're the opening, opening act, act yeah. and I, I I have never been so nervous in my yeah. life. And we played the first first song that we played was a song called "Make Way," and they actually played it longer. Uh huh. And I looked at him. I'm like, the song's over, guys. <laughs> and we just kind of kept going. Nobody caught on to it, but um, you know, it was <laughs> it was one of those things. It was very surreal. Yeah, very very surreal. Yeah. I I remember seeing like about maybe 50 kids like at the very bottom uh-huh. in a in a pit. Yeah, and then the rest, ten, eleven thousand, whatever they were, were just kind of staring. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that was a uh, that was a tough one. Yeah, well, that's amazing. I, I hadn't even thought about that that you did that tour. So you guys, that probably wasn't the only stadium you played either. Then, Kobo, you guys probably did some other ridiculously yeah. big venues. Yeah, in Chicago, we did UIC Pavilion. Yeah, and, wow, um, and all that. But that so, was actually a, a really long time ago already. I mean, that what, was in '95. What was it like being so. on the road with those dudes at that point. Oh, they're they're really guy, good guys. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Like those I've guys quite a lot. Things. Yeah. 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 Um, I haven't seen them probably since about 1996. Just haven't crossed paths. 
Oh, really? No. Okay. It's just, uh, I think just, you know, if they're green day, they're big, you know, I you don't cross paths with people like that. When yeah. And I mean, especially someone like me. Point. Yeah. Well, and they're, they're in such a different, yeah, they're, they're in a different seen, ball game now. Right. I feel like right. the last couple of records, it's not, right. It's not the same ball game. Any, anyway. you know, you guys, obviously with Dan Vapin and the cheats, you're, you're dealing a little bit now in the, the new music model, right? So you guys did band camp. And then Correct. did you guys you guys self release the first Dan Vapin and the Cheats records or was it with a label partner? No, no, no. We put out our own record. You this put is it all first, out by yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. All by yeah. yourself. Is this the first time you've really done that? This is that? the first time that I've ever put out a record uh by myself. Yep. And you guys did vinyl, you did CDs, and then we you did, did yeah. digital downloads, right? And then you guys That's made correct. it to one or two on the bandcamp charts, right? Yeah, we did really well on Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah. Which, it, yeah. So now, what was that experience like? Like dealing with that? I mean, I, I know um, you still owe me a record, by the way. <laughs> I know. I was just thinking that on the way over here, <laughs> I and I do have one. it. Um, uh, but yeah, you guys had to ship out the records yourselves, right? Correct. Ship out the CDs yourselves, yep. and you know, so so what was that experience like compared to before, where you know you were relying on labels? you know, mostly to do the distribution for you. And obviously then you had people buying records at record stores. Now they're right. buying them online. Right. Most people are buying stuff online. Like the digital um, aspect of it is is really easy through CD, yeah. baby. I mean, you pay $50, you fill out some forms and, you know, they get it everywhere. They yeah. It on uh, iTunes, Amazon, everything. Yeah. That that part of it's pretty easy. The uh, the CD part of it was, was pretty easy, I felt, yeah. um, because... Um, just I, I had a little experience in doing that before. Mm-hmm. What I found out is vinyl is very expensive. Yes. Um, vinyl was about five dollars per unit. Yep. So, um, you know, in order to do any any vinyl, you're having to you know mark stuff up pretty significantly. Well, yeah, to it's do a significant investment, with. right? And how many sure. do you guys press, right? I mean, really, the mo- the least you can reasonably get pressed is like three to 500 copies. We so. did five. You did five. We did five, so. but half of them were color and they went pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and so, and, you know, we're going to have to reorder. Yeah. Um, you know, fairly soon. But, um, you know, the funny thing about it is that, you know, you always hear about people talking uh, how vinyl is back. Mm-hmm. But the actual numbers suggest that CDs are still there because we sell more CDs than anything still. Yeah, I've actually. It's a very strange you know, thing. Yes. It's, and I've been telling the guys in the band this, you know, they're like, well, we got to get vinyl, we got to get vinyl. I'm like, you know what? The thing with vinyl is like the people that, that, that buy it are so enthusiastic to get it that they're very vocal about it. Mm-hmm. Where the where the, the actual numbers are those people that go, oh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick this up, the CD. Well, and plus and you then they don't the say CD. anything. <laughs> you can sell the CD for so much less, right? Yeah, and, well, that's there's that part of it, yeah, too. Yeah, and I've, I've gone through this whole thing. I mean, you know, I don't know if you know, but I work with, you know, some bands back in Detroit. I have this very small record label. I've done some vinyl now in the last few years. And what I've found is it's a very mixed bag with vinyl. Like you said, there are people who want it, right? But the people who don't really care about the format but still want some hard copy, they do want the CD. That's what they want because that's yeah. still what most people have. I'm I'm a, a fan of vinyl for sure. Yeah. I, I'm one of those guys that mm. when a band has vinyl, I'm pretty excited when about it. When they have it though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, then you go on the I, I do prefer vinyl over CDs. I don't really care for CDs to be honest with you. I didn't but, either. <laughs> but – I had that for whatever reason, with Dean one day because Dean whatever is reason, all about sell. CDs. Yeah, we, like, Dean we loves sell CDs. Them, and I was like, dude, I hate CDs. <laughs> like, right. I considered it like the worst music format ever. But now for some reason I'm finding myself buying them more because I still want the highest quality audio I can get my hands on. But some of the vinyl to get, especially for classic albums it, where yeah. I've lost the CD or something like that over the years – Dude, you can't get a used copy of some of these records for less than thirty or forty bucks. I just don't have the pocketbook for right. that, right? Sure, sure. You know, so and so. What are you guys doing? You guys just recorded with Matt Allison. We just recorded with Matt Allison. Yep. Uh, it's our follow up record, which we we are going to call two T W O. Nice. As uh, I decided that I'm done naming records, <laughs> <laughs> at least for now, so because just, they always sound in the cheats too. Yeah. Two. Excellent. This is our second record. Yeah. Um, yeah, it got to the point where I was just kind of forcing titles out. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, this doesn't even really mean anything. You mm-hmm. know? 
So I decided just to call it two, and the yeah. next one will be three. Okay. Um, <laughs> Eventually, I'll probably name a record, but yeah. Um, for now, yeah, that's and it's going to be called two. It's going to be on Torture Chamber Records, okay, uh, and it will be on all the same formats again: um, CD, uh, vinyl. Now, how is that going to work? You guys are you have a label doing this? Yeah, right? it's Torture our label. Chamber. Oh, it's your label. It's it's okay. our label, Torture so, Chamber. So you Records. guys still we, we put out our own stuff. Got the control of it. That's awesome. That's correct. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So you'll still be able to use Bandcamp. Correct. So we'll be able to use all those tools that are out there, which you know, you guys have obviously now you have you, you communicate differently with your fans now then, right? So Correct. you've got you've got Facebook. Yeah, you've Facebook got, and Twitter helps Twitter, a little bit. Twitter. I mean Bandcamp was was really big for Bandcamp us. Bandcamp was and, uh, huge, right? You can just put sure. music up there and then people have access to it. Even right you away. I mean YouTube is a is a help for us as well. Yeah. You know? And what do you guys do with YouTube? Like do you put just we don't even do it. I mean, other, other people do it, right? Yeah. That's what ends up happening, right? Right? right. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And, and then some, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's some really funny stuff on YouTube, actually. Yeah. Like, well, we, we a lot uh, of covers of, of stuff of, that I've done before. That's some cool. of them are really How cool. Good. Is that to see that? It's really surreal yeah. sometimes, you know, to see some kid in you know his or her bedroom. Um, Playing a guitar, playing and, a damn vapid song. Yeah, playing one of my songs. Yeah, yeah. it's really, really kind of. I mean, that's really kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that stuff is what amazes me that that now there's this interaction that just never existed before. Like you as an artist, give visibility into what people are doing with your music. Yeah, you know, I, I get to. Like, I'm like, wow, that, that's. Yeah, you always kind of wonder if there was that kid in a room, kind of doing uh -huh. that thing. I know well, I, you I were can that actually kid probably. Well, I, I was, was that, that kid. <laughs> well, like I told you that story about the social distortion yeah. song. I, 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 you know, I switched around and made yeah. my own. Yeah, I mean that's like basically listening to that and just kind of trying to figure it out and you know, um, and hopefully they're doing the same thing. You yeah. know, they're they're coming up with some you know, you know, cool approach to doing. Um, you know, whatever they're uh, inspired by. I'm glad to be a part of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be, I, I just say YouTube is always funny. Cause every time I go on there, it's like, you look at the comment section on so many videos and you just start losing your mind. You get like that internet rage <laughs> where you're just like, you see Oh, that's, that's the internet for you, man. Right. You know, it's the, the uh, land uh, of hate. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Getting back to the, the whole, um, record thing so yeah we have a record coming out it's mm -hmm. on torture chamber records all all the um all formats we're looking at july for a release date um so you know come visit us on our uh our facebook page or on Bandcamp, and uh you know hopefully you'll like our record it'll be now out. Are you guys doing a release yeah. show in chicago probably in august probably in august yeah. you guys don't have anything confirmed yet though still uh nothing confirmed it. yet because okay. we're still uh, we're still mixing the record. It's okay. going to be mixed as of Wednesday. Uh -huh. Are you guys doing so, a fest again this year? Maybe we're maybe. supposed to go to. I just uh, bought my ticket. You did. <laughs> yeah, last we were, year was last year was a trip, dude. Yeah, we were asked to go. Um, we were supposed to go to uh, Europe at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's kind of pending now. Okay. And if it falls through, we probably will play fest okay. this year. Um, cool, man. This was good. Thanks for doing the the first one of these. Hopefully there will be many more to come. I think I have like <laughs> seven or eight lined up now. you got so. a lot of editing to do, my friend. I have a lot of editing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of ranting yeah. going I'm on about to learn. I'm about to learn what that's all about. So, All right, cool, man. Okay, all man. Right. Thanks.